one of the uh, <coughs> biggest disappointments of my childhood was I never got to know either of my biological grandfathers. I had this really amazing man who stepped in, uh, who was my mom's stepdad, who came in after she was an adult, uh, who I called grandpa, uh, but the men that, I, that, that are my blood, I never once met. Um, and my grandfather on my dad's side, uh, I just loved hearing stories about him. It was really cool hearing about what my, how my dad would talk about him, that he was just this incredibly hard worker that he never remembers a single day of him missing work during his entire childhood. Not for sickness, not for bad weather, nothing. There was no reason he was missing work. But that also he was a pretty hard man. And he kind of prescribed that old maxim that children are to be seen and not heard. But I also loved hearing about how much he changed over the years, how he was, his heart softened and he became a very kind and uh, compassionate man. And I always loved hearing how my dad would say, man, he just really loved you. He was so excited to see you born. And unfortunately, um, when I was one year old, he died in a, in a workplace accident. And then on the other side of my family, uh, it's my mom's father. And he was a very interesting man, a real interesting life. See, when he was a young man about uh, middle, mid-20s, mid-30s, he had become incredibly successful. He would be the equivalent now of a multimillionaire. He had started this construction company all by himself and built it up. He had all these employees that just loved him. His peers in the business world loved him. He was just like this bastion of his community. And on a personal level, he was just wildly successful. He had this beautiful property with a house and a ranch. And my mom would always tell me about these horses that they got to ride from the time she was just a little girl. And the unfortunate part is Really what I know of my grandfather had nothing to do with that. What I know of him and the stories I really truly know, he was just a mean, vile person. An alcoholic, a womanizer, a woman beater who put my grandma in the hospital multiple times. He squandered and ruined his wealth and his business and his house and he, he was estranged from his daughters. In fact, one of the stories that just sticks out in my mind to just kind of show exactly who he was, was my mom's, uh, the start of my mom's senior year of high school. She had come back from going and spending the night at her friend's house, and she shows up at her house to find that it had burned down during the night. And my grandfather was there, and he looked at his daughter, and he said, well, good luck. And he hopped into his truck and drove off. And he left my mom Senior in high school, standing there, no home, no food, just the clothes on her back and a backpack. That's the legacy of the man that I call my Grandpa Chuck. And today, that's what we're talking about is legacy, and particularly legacy as viewed through the wisdom of Proverbs. And what I'd like you to do, if you have your Bible with you, is open to Proverbs 14.1. And we're going to be looking at legacy uh, through three different aspects and the first one we're going to look at is, is individual legacy. And what I mean by individual legacy really comes down to what are people going to say about you when your time is coming gone? When there's a eulogy for you, what are people going to remember? And actually what I'd like for you to do right now is take about five seconds and just picture that for a second. What do you think people are going to say about you? My hope is in those five seconds that what you, you see people picturing of you, it has nothing really to do about your hobbies. It's not just, oh, he, he really liked fishing. He spent all his time fishing. But it was something greater. That a legacy that you are building for yourself, an individual legacy, is about the values that you showed in your day-to-day -day life, the calling that you lived to, for. And the the good thing and maybe the bad thing is that you don't have to wait to the end of your life to really know what people think of you, what legacy you are currently building. In fact, I remember um, I just graduated from high school and uh, it was a time of MySpace. 
<clears throat> and if you knew anything about MySpace, it was just a way worse Facebook. And there, there was always these quizzes that people were just filling out because people just like to talk about themselves and make it known to everyone. And there was this one quiz that I filled out and had a question. Are you a Christian? And I'm like, oh yeah, yep. And I remember not even an hour later, I go look back at the replies and there's my sister and one of my two best friends. And each comment was, you're a Christian? What a gut punch. And at first I was just mad, like how could you say that? What a ridiculous thing. And then the more I processed it and thought on it, they were absolutely right. That I had been saved by Christ and I spent my time praying to God quite frequently, but on my, the exterior, everything I showed to everybody else, they would have no idea that I was a follower. My life did not resemble him at all. We're going to be looking at Proverbs 14, 1, and it says, The wise woman builds her house, but with her own hands, the foolish one tears hers down. That we, each one of us, have an opportunity to be building our legacy. You are building your legacy right now. And you have the choice to step into the legacy that God is calling you into or to foolishly squander it and either work towards nothing or, or worse yet, I think, tear down whatever it is you're building. There's a guy I, I really... Uh, that reminds me of the legacy he is building uh, throughout my life. And it's this guy, I think a lot of people, you guys will know him, is this guy right here, Tiger Woods. Maybe you can't, don't know who he is from the picture, but you probably heard of him. Right. He is the most awarded golfer of all time. And in the conversation for greatest golfer ever to walk the earth, just him and Jack Nicklaus. And I, as a kid, I loved watching ESPN in the morning, right before school. <coughs> and I gotta tell you, I, I don't really care for golf. There's, I, I would go on for hockey and baseball and football. And every morning it seemed that this guy was on TV and drove me nuts. But there's something really cool going on. Because every morning he was on TV, I don't know that I ever once saw that he wasn't winning. Like he just won nonstop every morning for about eight years of my life. He would show up and they're just talking about how Tiger Woods is blowing everybody out of the water. He's just so successful. And I didn't really care to watch him, but I did. I loved whenever they would show interviews with him and his father. Because the legacy he was building as the greatest golfer of all time, it was no mistake at all. See, from a very young age, he and his father had a singular purpose and goal. And they set out for it every day to build it brick by brick with their blood, sweat, and tears that he was going to work all day every day to achieve that goal that he had in mind to become that golfer. He was out on the green all the time. And his legacy showed it. Unfortunately, there's another legacy that Tiger Woods has, at least in my mind, and it's this. I remember also waking up one morning to ESPN, and they have a picture of this car from a bunch of different angles. And everybody's freaking out. What is going on with Tiger Woods? Did he crash? Did his wife, there was this rumor his wife had come out with his, go her, his golf club and started smashing the car. And what emerged over the next several days and weeks was that this was the result of an affair he had. And not just one affair, but dozens and dozens and dozens of affairs over the years. That while he was building up a legacy of the greatest golfer of all time, he was ruining his legacy as a, as a husband and a father. He ended up being divorced from his wife. And of course, with that comes the kids and his wealth that go split both ways. And for a lot of us, this is the legacy he built. Great golfer and failed relationship. And even beyond that, this started to bleed into his ability to golf. It seemed just shortly after that that he didn't start, he stopped winning every day. He turned to alcohol he was never the same golfer he was for the first years of his life. Excuse me. When we're talking about individual legacy, I think the important thing is that we look at 
that the wise woman builds. And I love how it says wise there because in Proverbs, it really tells us what wisdom is about. It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If we're building a legacy, it will often flow out of the master that we serve. And when we have the master we serve is the most high God, we cannot be helped to be transformed and changed by him so that our legacy and the impact we're making is shaped by him. And what often happens too often is that our legacy comes out of serving a lesser master. Money, greed, lust, self, on and on. And the problem with all of these is eventually they will require more than you can possibly give. They will require that you sacrifice your integrity and your values and your righteousness and everything you're building up through them will come crumbling down. That's what happened to Tiger Woods. That's what happened to my grandfather. And we're really talking about individual legacy because I think there's something more important going on that our legacy we're building isn't just about ourselves and what we do. It's really about the impact we're making through the generations. We're going to look at this from two different aspects. The first one is family. How are you building a legacy through your family? And we're going to look at Proverbs 22.6. It says, start children off on the way they should go. And even when they are old, they will not turn from it. I love how simple it is. It's just right there. If you start your kids off right, they'll end up right. No problem at all. <laughs> and before I really dive into this, I just wanted to pause for a second and give a caution, right? And I know it's been said before, but it bears repeating that the Proverbs are not a promise. And I highlight it with this one for a real reason that often what I've seen is this verse be used as a weapon. Because if it's a promise, it has to work out in reverse. That if your children, when they're adults, go away from the way that they were started, that means you failed them as a parent. And it's not fair. There have been some amazing parents that I've watched that unfortunately, when their kids turn out to be adults, everything they have taught and been loved and shown, and they just turn away. And I say that really to encourage you that while we have a great responsibility as parents it's not all on us. I love this quote. It's in a book, uh, I believe it's Family Discipleship, and it says, it says that as parents, we are stacking the kindling, but it's the responsibility of, the, of God and, and the person to light the fire. That we must take our role seriously, but in the end, it's not on us. I wanted to... Um, focus on two real aspects of this verse. The first one, the way. What does it mean start them off on the way? And actually there's a lot of biblical scholars that debate on this. What does this mean? And there's, there's all sorts of things. Is the way this particular path with these little stepping stones along the way and you better hit every last one of them and if you veer off well your kids are gonna they're gonna veer off as they grow old. And on the other side, it's this idea of, is the way, does every kid have a unique way that God has created them uniquely and gifted them in specific ways and they have specific weaknesses? And it's our job as a parent uh, to guide them through that and help them to realize where God is calling them. And to both of those, I say, yes, there's absolute value in both of those ideas. But there's something I really want to focus on different than that, than the, than the specific ways and strategies we do. It's a mindset that we carry. It's the foundation of what I think the way is. And I, I want to make very clear that I don't know that this is exactly what Solomon was saying when he wrote these. But I think it's absolutely true that we find the foundation of the way in Deuteronomy 6. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. That whatever else we teach our kids, it has to start with teaching them that they are loved and how to know and love God. That too often when we're saying start them off in the way, what we're focusing on is behavior modification. And what we miss is heart transformation. And I just wanted to give one piece of advice of how we go about this. And parents, you are in this really unique role and you have this incredible responsibility that you are shaping how your child views their heavenly father. 
and I've seen this all throughout my life. I've been involved in all sorts of different Catholic church, Lutheran church, and on and on. And I've met a lot of people, and, and there's this common thread that I hear often, that God is just a mean, spiteful, angry, distant person. And what I have found almost universally is from those people, they had parents who were mean, spiteful, angry, distant people. That it's really hard to love a God who you don't believe loves you. There's another passage I'd like to dive into. It's Exodus 34, 6. It says, this is, this is actually the most repeated passage in all of the Bible. And it's God revealing the character of himself. It says, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. That as parents, particularly if we call ourselves Christ followers, we are called to emulate our God, to grow in that, to be transformed, to look like this. And my question and challenge is, what are you showing your kids day in and day out? Is it compassion, graciousness, slow to anger, loving, faithful, that if you spend your days yelling and putting your kids down and not showing them love, it's really hard to feel loved. It's really hard if you don't feel loved to love anybody, including God. Excuse me. The second part I want to look at in Proverbs 22, 6 <clears throat> is the beginning. Start, children. And actually, we, we teach out of the NIV, but off, basically every other major translation doesn't use the word start. It uses the word teach or train. And again, there's so many different ways you Bible plans and prayer plans and this and that. And, and if you are looking for that, we have a family ministry at each campus that can help you out with that. But again, I want to challenge a mindset. Because when we say teach, what we do often is we approach this from an academic standpoint. That we're going to sit our kids down and we're going we're to tell them about theology and we're going to tell them what to do. And the words that we, that we say to them is teaching them that that's what they're going to live out. And the truth is, and the research backs this up, that what children learn is caught, not taught. That what you are modeling day in and day out is shaping who they are. Jamie and I, my wife Jamie and I, we've been doing uh, foster care for three years. And we've had, I think, seven or eight kids in our house. And we've seen how this idea has played out at an incredibly early age that we had this five-year-old girl. And uh, <coughs> she was adamant that she only ate McDonald's, Hot Pockets, and TV dinners, which is a really big problem in our house because Jamie and I have not eaten Hot Pockets or TV dinners since probably college. And uh, we go to McDonald's maybe two or three times a year. And talking to her, I found out, well, why, do, why is this the way you are? Why are you choosing only to eat these things? And it was because she had spent the first five years of her life watching her parents eat McDonald's and Hot Pockets and TV dinners exclusively. And the really strange thing was she also shared something that her parents said, you should eat your vegetables. You should eat good proteins. You should eat healthy. But what they were showing didn't match up what they were saying. And kids will always default to what you are showing them, what you are modeling. And we saw this time and time again with all the kids that had come in through foster care. The kids that repress, repress their feelings and hide everything, they saw it from their parents. They repressed their feelings and hid everything. The kids that struggled with lying and actually taking pride often in lying, it's because their parents lied and took pride in lying. And the same thing was also true, that their parents told them to be honest, their parents told them they had to deal with things. Their parents told them all these great things. But what they did always overrode that. That what we teach our kids is, for us for, is to support what we're doing, not to be the primary way in which we teach them. The third aspect of legacy that we want to talk about is mentoring. 
and we bring this up, and, and some of you guys, you just heard me talk about parenting, and so you've been checked out for the past 10 or 15 minutes. And I just want to encourage you, uh, maybe, it, you know, this is recorded. You can go back and watch it because everything I'm going to talk about is still true for you. Just because you don't have a kid that bears your name doesn't mean you don't have impact in the future generations. And there's, a, there's this group called the Barna Group. And they do this, like, they're like a Christian research group. And they have spent a lot of time on one topic so why are we seeing so many young adults leave the church? And they've got all this stuff, but one big thing kept popping up time and time again. They could predict with <laughs> really good certainty who would leave the church based on this one thing. How many adults poured into that kid during their first 18 years? And actually, they got really good at it. They got to this like magic number. It was five, five adults that every kid, by the time they become, a, become an adult, needs to have been mentored by five adults. And if they hit that five adult mark, the chance of them staying with their faith, staying with the church, skyrockets. 80, 80 plus percent. And if they fall short, the odds are dismal. It's like 20 percent. And I say that because I know there's a lot of people here, a lot of people listening, that you don't have kids of your own that maybe uh, that just wasn't for you. Maybe your kids have grown and left the house. Maybe, uh, I mean, Jamie and I dealt with issues having our own kids. Maybe that's just not what God had for you. But I want to encourage you that there are so many kids and youth that desperately need you that they need you to be a part of one of these five people. That your legacy may not come from straight through family, but it will come through, it can come through mentoring. And there's so many different groups of people out there. There's, some of you are the same age as the parents, right? They, I need, I'll just say, I need somebody my age that is repeating what I'm saying to my child. Because I know, I remember my parents when I get older, they become the Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. It's one ear and out the other. But what I found was I had several men in my life <laughs> and, and older women in my life who would say the exact same thing as my parents. Yeah, yeah. They probably had a point. <laughs> and some of you, you're, you're getting up there in years, 67 years old plus. You have accumulated a lifetime of knowledge and wisdom and if you're not pouring it out into the younger generation, you're squandering it. They need it. I need it. And there's another group kind of within their grandparents. And I hear this too often. I'm just at a new stage in my life and I'm not really sure where God's calling me. I want to tell you right now, there may be some other things you've got to figure out in that calling, but God is absolutely calling you to pour into your grandchildren. They need you. And, and to be honest, your children still need you. My guess is you still remember what it was like to be a parent. It was, it's an awesome experience. And I'm so great to do it. But there's one thing too. It is exhausting. I guess, I mean, and I'm sure you know it. Your kids need you to step up in their kids' lives or their grandchildren's lives. That you may not be the starting pitcher anymore, but you can be the reliever. Right? Uh, I'm just going to keep going with baseball reference, right? Roger Clemens needed Mariana Rivera. And for those of you who don't follow baseball, they're just this, this. They were really, really good, and they couldn't win a World Series without each other and the other players around them. You are desperately needed. There's one last group I really want to uh, want to speak into. And it's men. Because I look out in our society, and I'll be honest, I see a failure as men to mentor and guide the next generation. That for some reason, there's been this mindset that uh, raising our future is women's work. And our kids desperately need both strong men and strong women to guide them through life. 
I uh, just went over to Green Elementary a couple weeks ago. We're putting together gifts for all the staff members. And I got a list. There are 41 employees there. Three of them are men. And two of those guys are custodians. The school my daughter goes to, she spends six and a half hours a day, five days a week, and she'll spend six years there. And overwhelmingly, she will not have any chance of having a male role model there unless she's in that one teacher's class. And I bring that up because I know that's just one small, <laughs> one small example, but what I see and what I read about across our country, across our society, across our churches, is that our kids are not being poured into by men enough. And women, I just, I, I want to make sure that you're not mishearing me. I am not saying anything wrong about what you're doing. I'm so grateful for how you have stepped up. But men, there is another place outside of the football field for us to get involved. We have classes here. We have schools that need volunteers. It's all over and you are desperately, desperately needed. Our young boys need strong <laughs> Christ-following, God-fearing men to show them what it means to grow into that. And our young girls, they need to be in proper relationship with Christ-following, women honoring, sacrificial men who value them for something other than their bodies. I think there's a lot going wrong with our society, but I, I have to challenge and step up and say that we need to step up and step into mentoring roles. That we need to establish a legacy of mentoring that impacts the future generations. So my question for everyone here is what kind of legacy, what is your legacy? What kind of legacy are you building? For some of you, Unfortunately, what I'm seeing is your legacy is going to be that you went to work and then you came home and watched TV for six hours a day. And you are undoubtedly being called by God into something greater. This man right here, uh, Billy Graham. You may know nothing about him, but you've probably heard of him. He has impacted the lives of millions of people and what's really impressive is how he's not just impacted the people that he spoke to and the presidents and the athletes and celebrities that he counseled, but the generations down the line, kids and grandchildren. And I'll be honest, like I probably shouldn't admit this as a pastor, but I really have no idea about Billy Graham. I've never heard him speak. I, don't, I, I know he was really influential, but his legacy has impacted my family and my church family through this. Operation Christmas Child. Every year, my kids and we, we get so excited to go fill up these shoe boxes that get sent around the world to impact children's lives. He has built a legacy that will be felt through the generations for years to come. So my question is, what kind of legacy are you building? What kind of impact are you leaving? I'm going to go ahead and release to uh, the other campuses. Thank you guys so much. I love you. Have a great day.